So hi everyone and uh, welcome to our, in fact this is our second last session of Intimate Archives for those who've been following along or those who don't know. We've been running this series from the beginning of the year and I think this session um, again goes really to the heart of I think what we're trying to do, right, which is, you know, think about the archive in a more broader sense, um, think of, uh, you know, more classic kind of state narratives as it were and how those are being inflected or recast in different ways and in today's talk where we're going to be looking at histories of liberation struggles in particular i think we're doing that in two ways right one is obviously thinking about um, smaller marginalized histories and actors and how they might uh, inflect what we know about these histories in specific ways and also think about how the archive changes when we think of uh, text, different forms of text, visual, artistic, aesthetic, and so on and so forth. So I think those are at least uh, two ways in which we're going to maybe try and rethink the concept of archive. But I'm particularly excited that we're talking about Mozambique. We're talking about uh, surprisingly <laughs> an area which is so close to us in South Africa, but which we don't always teach. And I, I think particularly the students I engage with in the social sciences, not maybe history, don't actually know a lot about Lusophone Africa. And as I think all of us might know, you know, South Africans, as indeed even Indians, can be quite parochial and inward looking. So I hope particularly for our South African audiences, this is really an opportunity to not just know about the history of, you know, a bordering country, but actually engage with the really vibrant scholarly uh, an artistic production, which is, you know, our collective inheritance, uh, collective heritage of Southern Africa. Okay, so uh, we have three speakers uh, today. Our first speaker is Maria Paula Meneses, who's a researcher at the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra, a Mozambican scholar. Uh, she did, I thought this was fascinating, by the way, you did so your schooling in Maputo, your graduate studies in the USSR, and then a PhD from Rutgers, the US, um, which is very interesting in and of itself. <laughs> um, Marie, uh, Marie Paula's research has looked at the political history and the social legal complexity of Southern Africa, especially Mozambique, Angola, and South Africa. Uh, and her work has been published in a number of journals, books, and reports uh, in several countries, including Mozambique, Spain, Portugal, the United States, um, Germany, Colombia, amongst others, and your recent publications include uh, Knowledges Born in Struggle, Constructing the Epistemologies of the Global South. I think that'll be interest, of interest to a lot of uh, our audiences, um, as well as, ooh, and I'm going to not even try and read that, but is there an English translation for, for the next book? Paula? Uh, it's on witchcraft. Accusations. Oh, oh wow. Kai knows I've been working on it. <laughs> so I'm going to copy paste both here and maybe share, and you could actually share a link so that maybe people can click and find out a little bit more about the book. So as I said, I, I know these are exceptional circumstances. So thank you so much for making the time and being with us today. Our next speaker is Hamilton Nevis, who's a documentary photographer and a visual anthropologist. He holds a BA in anthropology from Eduardo Mondlane University in Mozambique and is currently pursuing a master's in visual and media anthropology in Berlin. Uh, and among several visual projects, he's produced Godmothers of War in 2018, a portrait series exploring the lives of Mozambican women who supported the efforts of the Portuguese colonizers during the war for independence. And again, Hamilton, I wondered if you could share a link so you know people could like maybe get to know a little bit more about the project. Okay. And yeah, and uh, again, thank you so much for making the time for this. We, you know, we absolutely, I mean, academics do this stuff all the time, but particularly for people like yourself to make the time to engage with us and our audiences, we are so grateful. And finally, our very own Kyle Arujo is going to be a discussant. So Kyle is going to, you know, raise a few questions and just um, get the conversation going. Kyle, as I think most of you know by now, is a postdoctoral fellow at Wits Wiser, uh, and all things governing intimacies, especially this series, has really been Kayo's brainchild. 
more specifically, Kai has been involved in a, a, a smaller project, which is part of uh, GI, which is funded by us and also by uh, Gala, the uh, gay and lesbian archive here in Johannesburg, uh, which is called the Archives of the Internet. And it's basically an oral history project looking at uh, queer lives and communities in Lusophone Africa. And it's really started and consolidated a massive piece of research around uh, Maputo and Mozambique. And that's actually just been, just come out as this beautiful book of uh, photo essays. And I'll try and share a link to that. So again, those of you who are interested can, can follow up. Okay, um, Paula, would you like to start? And if you'd like to share the uh, PowerPoint presentation, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Boa tarde a todos e a todos. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and to be talking about lots, basic lots of interviews that I finally decided to put together and make sense of some of them. Because my interest has been on the nationalist struggles all over Southern Africa, and it's basically about it. I'll be sharing some ideas about you, especially because most of the material I've been collecting over the years uh, have shown that women are at the forefront of nationalist movements across the globe. And these struggles have been less visible and audible than the macro-masculine narrative. This is why I really appreciate and I thank the efforts put together by Kai Warujo, Sheila Roy and Yurisha Pillai to engage with Hamilton in a broader analysis of the archives of liberation in Mozambique aiming to rescue, so to speak, uh, other agencies and agents involved in this broad sense on the nationalist struggle. In Southern Africa, which is the context I'm more familiar with, colonialism and its violent subjugation of men and women inevitably led to the rise of nationalist struggles. In Mozambique, women were at the forefront of the struggle disputing gender roles and creating new spaces for their political activism. However, why are they silenced? Why don't we speak so much about their goals, their reflections, their positions? As you are aware, the armed struggle in Southern Africa, and I'm talking specifically about Mozambique, Angola, Namibia, and Zimbabwe, have shaped the discourse on the nature and agents of political involvement. And although there is a growing number of inspiring, very inspiring studies that over the recent decades have been challenging the dominant nationalist historiography, acknowledging also the role played by women who left home and joined the nationalist armed struggle, most of these studies tend to rent invisible the experience of women that from home, and I'm talking from home, carried on the struggle and redefine the meaning of the struggle. So uh, the question is, how do we not speak about it? In this, in this presentation, as I said in the very beginning, I'm trying to address the results of various interdisciplinary research projects that have been carrying on <clears throat> over the last 20 years, combining in most cases, anthropology with history, which are the two areas I did my graduate studies, aiming to contributing towards understanding the nuances of social life in the unequal, often very violent society that knows in the East. As many scholars have directed, as I said, little attention towards exploring in detail violence in the context of intimacy in a very systematic way. And in order to ask questions and to be understood by women, and this is one of the methodological challenges, that's why I want to address it briefly, the way one speaks has to be decipherable by all involved in the conversations. And quite often they were not interviews, they were conversations and the talk will flow. And more often than one of the concepts used to decode the experiences transmitted by these testimonies and quite often mediated by, trans by translators, limited the reading of material because of the power knowledge nexus associated with the conversations. So the alternative very often became uh, the, the way of explore testimonies as a performative way, a position that requires quite often a unique, unique the constructions of meanings as a process. So I didn't start 
with a final definition of what I was looking for, the meaning of women, meaning of participation in political struggle. And I'm still going with this ongoing process of understanding what struggle was about. And this process entails pre-existing knowledge born out of experiences, and it's simultaneously shaped by the, encourage, by the encounter and encouragement and the engagement when the testimony is given. So I try to combine archival, both public and private, oral and written, uh, with the, this idea of grasping of what women have to say. And in that sense, a, a fundamental concept was home uh, as a key political space of female anti-colonial resistance. And the question of home places, which is an expression and an approach I borrowed from Bell Woods, came to symbolize the safe areas for women whose lives were crossed by war. And especially adding to this, I use the concept of the small voices in history and the approach suggested by Ranajit Gore. And I've been trying to, using women's personal narratives on the one hand, to explore the need for a fairer recognition of how women experience particular forms of suffering and oppression and the violence of colonialism and of the independence. And on the other hand, to expand the political implications of their narratives about survival, about resistance, about the meaning of struggle. And when I'm referring to small lists, the small voices, I'm addressing the narratives of common women, the majority of population of Mozambique, as official history, as many historians have shown, is in general addresses the story of small group of people and fulfills a specific goal to justify the patriotic narrative that is at the core of the nationalist project. And in Mozambique, it was the liberation war. In 1964, at the outbreak of the nationalist armed struggle, Trevino, the main nationalist movement, but not the only one, proclaimed Mozambican revolution as an immense movement and irreversible as the force of nature with roots in the wills and aspirations of each Mozambican, and we would assume men and women. However, the perverse association of colonial authority with local male authorities that would be followed under the corpus of traditional power structures produce a knowledge power nexus filled with the silence of exclusions, erosions, distortions, and arbitrary fictions about women in contemporary struggles for rights and dignity. And this nexus has been actively silencing women's presence in the front line, concealing a variety of tensions and antagonism that have permeated the, and still permeate Mozambicans' recent history. And when listening to personal narratives of ordinary women about the war, the misogynistic and colonial message permeated most of the testimonies. And as several authors suggest, some of the expression of misogyny result quite often from this dichotomy, virgin prostitute complex, that is the inability to understand women, if not through them as a maternal figure or as a prostitute. It is through this dichotomy that the presence of women in nationalist struggle was evaluated quite often, which leads to considering many of the women who had not adhered to a standard of moral purity as a prostitute. And this interpretation of position of women in the struggle is present in many of the interventions about women in the armed struggle, made either during this, the process of the struggle, and there are lots of testimonies about it, and even in the first years of independence. And although this position has been disputed by a series of feminist readings over the last decades, the story of the common of the struggle of the common women in war remains to be told. We know a lot about women in the guerrilla struggle, but almost nothing, as I said, about the vast majority of Mozambican women. In parallel, what was interesting was that throughout the struggle, women quite often would mention photographs and will show up those little square pieces of paper showing what happened during the war. Uh, and, and these photographs that quite often women shared with me became also elements of contact between myself, a researcher, 
and my interviewees, they've opened the door to private memories of war times, together with oral testimonies, with written sources. Photographs became time capsules mirroring the past encounter generated by colonial violence, but contributing to expose the presence, lives, affections, and violence experienced by these women whose lives were crossed by war. And in the image, we have images of women in so called 100% zones of war. In northern Mozambique, they are Tet province and Cap Delgado, but plenty of women, as you see. I'm trying to come down with the next slide and it's not coming down. I don't know if it's too heavy. Okay. Exposing women, images of women as prostitutes allowed us to open a debate about what they represent in the past and their weight in the present. Backing a little in a sense and Laura Stoller work on colonial images, which exposed white men's disdainful gaze the explicit sexual images suggesting that pornography was not a marginal corollary of colonization, but rather a constituent element. But to what extent does the continued reproduction of these images in web pages, in social networks, without authorization from the owners of the image or their descendant, is not contributing to reaffirm this colonial abyssal line where some are citizens and the images belong to them? And the other, the subalterns, continue to be violated through their eroticized exposure. Many are like the rights of photographers to, portray, to portray the suffering of people, bringing them to us. But in looking at these images, images of war, of famine, of violence, we should raise, in my view, a stronger question. What is my responsibility in this process? What led to this happening? And I'm just in finalizing, sharing a couple of uh, testimonies with some photographs and comments on the stories collected. This photograph, I tried to distort it as much as possible because when I was interviewing one of women, and I've been interviewing women all over the country, uh, suddenly she told me, that's me in the picture. So we, it was really a very awkward and very violent moment to me because the Portuguese colonial political intervention model that we studied in practice, it illustrates the systematic character of the sexual domination of the colonized bodies, denouncing both physical and symbolic violence that was exercised over women, hostages of an equal power relation. And through the, the testimony of these women, you see the various moments of violence that she, she experienced, experienced in a resettlement village, Aldiamento, in northern Mozambique. So if photographs produce a set of objects, meaning and social relations through which histories are articulated, I think it's fundamental to understand their impact in the reconstructions of stories and on the lives of people that live through those stories. And dressing an African girl was not understood by the Portuguese military as an act of sexual violence. Believe me, I have very many photographs like this and they never say, they just say, oh, the African girls like very much. So it's always that and critical sense of violence. In spite of the time, the time that has passed, this, this image continues to reproduce the relationship of violence by imposing an inexorable truth that choked a woman already by the time I interview a, a grandmother. As this was our, our image, as I said, this reveals how important it is to explore the ways in which visual practice, such as the use of photographs or other archival documents with unwanting truth, are related to other sensory expressions through which the past is articulated beyond the image or the willing of the testimony per se. The second one, and this is a relation with Anne Milton's uh, work. It's a testimony of a woman that was the godmother war uh, and was denounced as being a collaborator with the Portuguese and was sent to the re-education camp in northern Mozambique. I interviewed a couple of years ago in, in Maputo. As this contrasting image examples show, our ability to understand the emotional history of the empire will always be constrained by the extent to which its expression was rendered public or subsequently preserved. 
It is also about our capacity to fulfill, to fully understand the multiple levels of violence experienced by women. The deep, complex, and violent, varied emotional experience that constitute the domain of subjectivity, too often backtracking in and out of norms and structures. By combining testimonies with the power of images and archival written sources, I'm trying to expose as far as possible and with the place of caution associated with unveiling of various in feelings such as revolt, hatred, envy, and love, pieces of stories lived by women who experienced war in the first person in the front lines. In the Mozambican context, these memories uncover a very violent past, still overshadowed by the official narrative of nationalist liberation struggle. A process that has been notably criticized by Partha Chatterjee, who highlights that any history of nationalist emancipation is necessarily a history of betrayal, for freedom can only be conferred by imposing at the same time a whole set of new forms of control. The main trap of these nationalist projects is their insistent, insistent effort to reproduce a national identity who of abyssal exclusions, limiting the ontological and epistemological co-presence of different agents. The re-entry of these women through their unwords and experience call for other epistemological stances, which create space for other existences. It's up to us to learn how ethically use the archives of memories, of written sources, of photographs, helping to strengthen the liberating ethic beyond any form of oppression. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I'm done. Thank and you. I think I manage the time, right? Brilliantly. Um, should we go straight to Hamilton? Who's also going to share their screen? Milton, I think you're muted. So if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I think he's just trying to get the show. Yeah, on okay. the yeah I'm so trying to, 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 to share the. It did work though, uh, just yes. you know, a couple of minutes before. Okay, good. I hope you guys can see uh, all the photographs here. The, so. Uh, on this particular work, I'm trying to, to focus on 1961 to, to 75, which is a period that uh, it was uh, for Madrinas de Guerra, which is the, pro the project that I'm, um, I did, uh, they were more active. So Madrinas de Guerra, just to give small information about it, it there were, 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 were women who has been uh, invited or recruited by the Portuguese government to be part of part of the psychosocialization because in 1961 in Mozambique, they have this psychosocialization because they knew that any time psychosocialization is, it, it was kind of, uh, uh, let me explain, it was kind of end of in this night, in this night, which is people, they start to, 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 to change their names and they, they become Miguel and they, they're not, they, 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 did, they didn't follow the, the traditional name. So in these movements, uh, the women that have been recruited to be part of uh, uh, this movement, just to be, just to, to, to give uh, uh, emotion, emotional support to the military. So uh, those, all these photo, all these photographs uh, has been taken in, 19, in 2018. Uh, with old women, which is all the all, all of them, they, they have different different ages because they 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 join this movement on the different ages. Just to, we can see and we can talk about more. Oh. Okay, I don't know if you you guys can see everything. All the. 
We, we are seeing your, your, Sabes, tens, uh, de carregar, tens de abrir cada uma delas, desculpa, Hamilton. Abre cada uma e vai mostrando cada uma. Sim, 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 sim. É o que estou a fazer. Não, tens de sair do compartimentar, abrir cada uma e depois voltares oh, oh. atrás, senão não vais conseguir. Não vou conseguir. Opa, opa. Desculpa. Não, não, ok, tá bom, obrigado. Obrigado, uh... Ok. Sorry, start to share, share the yeah, scan of sex, okay, what I'm doing here, share room, I don't know if you, if, if, if you can see, Yes, now we can see. Oh, thank you, thank you. So, as as I was saying, uh, that uh, all this those women they were part of uh, uh, sexualization, which is men or, 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 of 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 them. Some of them they met the Portuguese uh, soldiers. They they met some of them. They have kids. Some of them they didn't even uh, had a contact despite the letter because the 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 the, 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 the program was to, to to send the letter to the soldier and to to, to give the soldier um uh, uh feeling as as they in the war so when 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 Mozambique gets into the 1977 75 all these women uh based on my research there's we punish to be to be part of uh, of the, of the Portuguese side so and all of them that i'm showing the the specific living in mafalala which is it was it was a, it was a site uh, it was it was a area that the black people before the independence they used to, they, they used to live there so that's that's one of the the photographs and I'll go back okay so So uh, I try to, 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 to combine, then we, talk, we can talk about a technical aspect. I tried to combine the house that they used to live in and the, and the, 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 the clothes that they used, they, they used to wear at that time. So if you, if you can see closely, you, you, will, you will understand that these clothes, they, they were, they were, they were clothes they used, where they, which clothes they used to wear uh, in the times of, uh, uh, before the independence. So it's uh, some of some of the portraits outside and some of some of the portraits I do I do inside the house, but always trying to combine this this house, this narrative and 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 also to to to, to try to to not deny the fact that the, all the house uh, they, they build it they, they use tiles to build it the, the same houses. Uh, sorry about that. It's taking so long, but I thought that uh, it will be so fast. So uh, have all 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 the photographs has different meaning and different uh, outfit because uh, talking to them, researching deeply, 
uh, I start to first I, I, I spent three years try to convince them how to give me space to photograph them because it's something that it's really sensible to them and uh, it was really complicated to 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 make them tell their stories. So uh, on this process, uh, I I figured out that. Uh, they had a lot of artifact, like things that the uh, memories that uh, they keep with, with them. This 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 wedding with this wedding wedding dress, she has been keeping for a long time because uh, she has been promised to marry this soldier, as she said to me, and the soldier never came back. Like uh, went to Nyanza and get killed in Nyanza, which was uh, I don't know if if everyone knows Nyanza was a in terms of, uh, it was really hard for the military. The attacks was, was so frequent. And if you, if, you, if you go researching all the latest, a lot of the latest that they exist, they come, most of them come from Nyasa, which is really dramatic. So also, I tried to play with the, with the, with the colors, uh, create a, a static approach on this project because I'm, uh, I was trying to, to photograph the people, yes, but uh, trying to get the feeling, bring the feeling that uh, we're talking, we're, we are talking about the past, but also we're in the present. How, how this, this, these things has to re relate to to if it's my odd i try to to touch the audience in terms of they can see something that is new but also at the same time the old so these these colors all this this pose and, and the people uh it's the combining of this stuff So this house is uh, the house that uh, oh, since, since then they, they live there. You can see that uh, on time goes past, the, the house get damaged. Uh, they, they didn't have any, 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 any money to, 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 to put this, this house together. Because I, I, I should say that those, all these women, based on 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 on, on the, the the research that i made or based on the interview that i, I did with uh, louis Lefort, which is someone who wrote also about uh, madrina Figuera, he said that uh, uh, he said that uh, all these women when the when when the, the when, when we got independence all these women that's been photographed and the 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 the, the, the distribute all the photograph on the minist and the place that they cannot give a work. I'm talking about someone who, who was educated that time, who has normally to have a four, I would say four degree, quarter class in Portuguese, it was, it was difficult. And uh, those women have this one, which is, was, it, it, was, it was a part of uh, this knowledge or was a part of this quality to be part of the godmother of war. So after independence, uh, having all this knowledge, having all this uh, high level statute, and they cannot ha work because they were part of the Portuguese government. It was, it was hard. And we have to understand that uh, uh, all this country, the, 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 the adopts uh, social, socialist, so, 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 socialist, uh, so, so, socialist uh, modern which is, uh, it was to, the, the government produce everything and, and they divide 
among all of us uh, equally. They didn't have a, a, a private sector. So if he, someone who uh, you, you supposed to work at the government and he cannot work at the government, which means have to go to informal place. So that's why these women, they survive selling vegetables in, uh, in the markets, doing this thing because they cannot work uh, based on the background that they had supporting the Portuguese. So I will try to share the, the last one, not have so as I say, all all this house has been damaged for time. All this these people, they didn't have opportunity. But if you can see all of the photograph, the dignity. The, the 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 pose and the 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 things that the, the the power you can find on all of these women, which is something that it was really interesting for me doing 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 this work, even though they cannot have uh, they didn't have any support any opportunity, but they're proud to be to be to be Mozambicans, uh, the proud to be women and to, to, to despite all of this because. We have to understand that there's been they've been used for the they be they've been used by Portuguese government and they've been blamed by Mozambican government. So he didn't have no choice. And we have to understand that the 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 they get uh they got they got um, this opportunity to to be part of, of the cycle of socialization. Some of some of some of those some of them they're so young and he, it wasn't. It was difficult to create to 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 have a own decision as a woman that time. So and he didn't understand one day. Didn't think that one day Mozambique will be free. So so why this woman has been punished for all life because of the bad decision? But and again in my research I was an observer. So I was looking at the story. I was using archive. I didn't want to judge people or try to. To, to to give this story different different path. Okay. So this is this is, will be the, the, the last image that I will share I will share to not spend more time. Uh, as you can see, that's a living room that they're living in it. Uh, how how the condition that uh, uh, these people are living on. Mm, that's pretty much. So there is a lot of things that I didn't mention here. If we, if you have some question. Please, uh, I'm, I'm happy to to to, to answer because uh, uh, it's 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 a really a broad it's a really broad story. So I cannot just cover this all the details unless uh, unless you can you can ask me. So thank you. Stop to share. Thank you, Hamilton. I'm, I'm already bursting with quite a lot of questions. I mean, starting from just how you found the women and what your, you know, your interactions with them were like. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll pause those and hand over to Kayo. And just to tell our audience, uh, please feel free to post your questions or comments as you are already in the chat function. But I think more uh, direct questions are probably better in the using the Q&A function because then, uh, you know, both uh, Paul and Hamilton can see it directly, but feel free to use whatever is, is easy. Um, Kyle? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Srila. Thank you, Hamilton, uh, Paula. These were such uh, powerful um, presentations, and I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to hear uh, about this work. 
I'm gonna try to be very, very, um, you know, uh, quick here because I want to give ample time for debate. And what I thought I would do as in this role of mine as a discussant would basically try to kind of, um, you know, think of common threads between both your projects and also how they relate to the work we have been doing here in governing intimacies and through this uh, webinar series. And then I have a couple of questions. So I, I'm really um, excited that you manage that we managed to have this panel because what many people may not know, we spoke about this in previous episodes, but this webinar series has been pretty much a result of a conference idea that we were organizing in Maputo in 2020, and then it never materialized because of the pandemic. And it was really, you know, trying to work through this notion of the intimate archive. And that's kind of where this webinar series uh, has come from. And I'm really glad that we are having this opportunity to bring the kind of Mozambique focused work that the conference would very much uh, have. And th the first thing I, I think it's, it's fascinating about both presentations is really how they kind of push us to rethink this history and this archive of liberation in Southern Africa. Obviously, in the region, because liberation has been very often attached to liberation struggles, the history of liberation becomes a kind of military history. So that's something that has been um, conventionally done. And, um, and I think both of these works, they really encourage us and push us to think in new directions. And just a shout out in the audience, we have some amazing historians who have also been doing histories of liberation, speaking of gender and sexuality in very new and exciting ways. So I hope we have um, an interesting uh, debate. But what I do think that uh, these papers they also speak to is, you know, that is something that Paula mentioned, how these kinds of liberation histories, they have been very much focused on the idea of the fighter, of the soldier, of the guerrilla fighter. And even when we speak about women in these histories, it's again, the history of women fighters then, which doesn't really challenge the centrality of the fighter as the agent of liberation history. But what I think, you know, both these projects are questioning us to do is how do we incorporate common women, quote unquote, common women, or even like the ordinary person within these histories of liberation without resorting to the kind of very moralist idea of the colonial collaborator. And I think this is like both the projects are really speaking to this theme. And here I'm thinking of the very classic text by uh, Amina Mama, Sheroes and Villains in African History, in which is really talking about this, about how certain historical actors, they are imagined as villains of history. And in that particular text, she gives the example of prostitutes, very much in the same uh, way that pa Paula was uh, telling us about. So I guess one of my reflections would be would, so, you know, a very fascinating and exciting project would be precisely to tell the histories of these villains and also questioning why they became or how, are, why are they imagined as villains in the first place. But then those are my kind of general thoughts around the presentations. And again, thank you very much. But I just want to bring an issue and then perhaps Paula and Milton can respond to it, or then we can take questions from the audience as well. But I think Paula raised a, such a important point when we are talking about opening up the archive and doing oral histories, which is the ethical dimension of all that. Something extremely powerful in your presentation is when you describe the research conversation as a violent moment because it's dealing with all these violent memories 
and the kind of archival fragments themselves, like the photographs you're talking about, they themselves have a violent history. So I, I think it, it, it feels really fresh to have this kind of you know, ethical conversation about how to use these materials and also how we can allow them to circulate. So perhaps that's something that you could elaborate on a little bit. I was very interested to hear about your strategies in dealing with this material. You showed a kind of pixelated picture, which I think it, it, it's kind of, it's, it's a very interesting uh, thing to do. So if you could perhaps elaborate on this kind of uh, ethical uh, conundrum. And then relating to a Milton's uh, project, which also brings up this kind of ethical dimension, but here it, 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 it's a little bit different because it seems to me that the whole project relies on the kind of, on the premise that you are giving these women, you are giving these interlocutors a platform to self-archive. By that, I mean, they are, you know, for example, when you say that they are selecting the clothes they want to be photographed uh, in, you know, how they want to portray when you're talking about, you know, this kind of a very, uh, you know, a, a very, um, th this portrayal that it, that is, you know, embedded in this dignity on this, on this notions of of, of being proud of their, of their histories despite all the diversity. I think that's perhaps what makes this project really, really so fascinating and powerful. And I think again, th that circles back to the previous question about how do archival fragments circulate? Paula mentioned photographs that are just online in a very problematic way, but then you are presenting an exhibition project, which is another ways in which these images are circulating. So I would be very, you know, interested in hearing more about, about that. What, what is involved in these kinds of initiatives when we are making a archive circulate through different means? So I don't know if you want to, um, a uh, kind of, uh, if you want the opportunity to answer to what I just said, or if we can open to, to debate, Srila? Um, I don't know, what do you, what do you both uh, think? I mean, there is one question directly to Paula. I mean, I also just to uh, get in there really quickly, it was just so striking, the, the photographs, you know, juxtaposed against at each other, like the two different, well, the archives. I mean, that one of, uh, I mean, as you said, the violence of it, and then, in Hamilton's case, the, the reappropriation of the image to, to really show these really strong, very dignified women looking very, you know, directly at your gaze. And I just thought it was very, very striking. And what that might tell us about photography, I, I suppose, or the image. I mean, there's a lot that one can say, but it just, yeah, it just it just stays with me that that um, that that um, the contradiction. Yeah, Paula. Would you like to say a few things to Kyle and we can wait for some more? Maybe we can start with the Milton, so it's sure. not over. So Milton, you go and then I'll, <laughs> then I'll go. And, and I don't know, Milton, if you could say something about, uh, you know, thank, the, the thank. prior part of the project, like how you, how you found uh, this particular uh, group of women, if you'd like to. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, Paul. Uh, yeah, Maria, Maria Paul, sorry. Um, so I think, uh, oh, this project came out came out uh, because I I really want I really like to 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 hear stories and and to hear to hear uh, some some other speech. And uh, there is a speech who who is talking about the uh, popomus madrinas de guerra, and they get my attention, and I start to research specifically who was madrinas de guerra. And I, I I interviewed some of the military, and I went to Mafalala, uh, which is area, and I start to find those people particularly, which is that took me forever to assume that they were they were they were, they were my dreams. So uh, when it comes to I, I, I will trying to ask the question uh, the question, which is, says 
ethical approach. Uh, when it when it comes to to representation, uh, when when people uh, give you or or when, when when people trust you to tell their stories, because there's a question who tell who tell the, the other people's story, which responsibility we have and to give the that the people giving give us giving us like uh, okay you can tell uh, this story of mine uh, is something that you you have to take on on the two hand and to, and to try to dignify these people in order to 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 please these people so uh, uh, that was the process also. Well, when 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 it talks about why the 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 choose choose the clothes, choosing the clothes, it was a it, it was a part of the my methodology. How these people they, they they can feel inside the project. I didn't. I, I want to include them inside the project to feel that they were part of the project, not uh, to be photographed as an object, but as a people. So that's why we can see that. Uh, they're so engaged, and you can see uh, them that uh, they understand what I was doing because I explained to them. They 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 knew it. Uh, the the time that I explained to them, it's a result of the of, of this frame that uh, you guys can see. So ethical, it's really important when you talk about uh, this kind of sensible problem because. If I if you portrait, uh, if you miss your point, they can be see as a prostitute, and I didn't want to, to 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 portray them as a as a prostitute. I want to portray them as a people who who join uh, Portuguese government, and some of them they met the 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 they met, they met the soldier, and some of them know. And I didn't want to generalize to put all of them in the same box. So it's a the, the ethic plays a really big role in this project because uh, I had to to find a way that can explain in details and make sure that uh, they are not that there, there was there was impressed so I don't know if if I, I, I asked this question correctly but uh, uh, I think I think that's what was my 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 research uh, methods. Okay, so um, to explain why. Um, I am very careful about using data from archive, being it oral, written, photographs, whatsoever, because of the implications sometimes it has. Uh, let me start, start with the story. I was uh, going through archives here in Portugal, and suddenly I came up with an information. As you know, most of the archives from PIDA, the Portuguese secret police were destroyed in Mozambique between uh, the September 7 agreement and uh, the constitution of transitional government. So the Portuguese decided to burn the archives. So there was a burning in Maputo where they, then Lawrence Marx, where they brought most of the information. But suddenly, you know that there were seven copies always made. So it, sometimes you get glimpses of what that archive, uh, what integral information. And there was a high person in Mozambique in the government that was accused of being suspicious, by, it was advanced by PDGS as being an, a prominent informer about Frelimo. Uh, and, and it was a very sensitive topic because we know that sometimes we have always to do the contradictory to try to find out why that information is there. And although it was supposed to be a highly confidential source, it was a A2, uh, it, it goes by letters and numbers, the levels of confidence. Uh, I decided not to come out with document. I have a copy of it, but still um, it's, it's something to think about because sometimes we, it's not a sensationalism that I'm looking for, but rather I'm trying to, to give voice to the small voices, to the little voices, to women, to common people, and especially women, because normally nobody wants to talk about them, what they do, because even themselves, when they talk about their role in war, uh, most of the conversations start 
with sentence like, I did nothing. What I was doing was what I always did throughout my life. I fed people, I fetch water. Sometimes we shared information, but they, they don't play their roles because that's their everyday activity. So it br brought me to the question to ask people that were involved in the liberation struggle, what did they do when they were in the liberated areas, especially liberated areas inside Mozambique? Because as we know, armed attacks are a phenomena. So what did they do when they were not fighting? They were laughing, they, they would talk, they would teach, they would cultivate. So there was a sense of a routine of everyday activity. We don't pay attention because we are trained to focus on big military events. So that is one of the questions that I learned throughout this process. But it also taught me that in order to be able to ask questions, I had to gain the confidence of the person. And to gain the confidence is either because I had friends who would introduce me and tell that I was someone they could trust, or it will go throughout the years, throughout the conversation. Some of the conversations started more than 10 years ago. And only recently I was able to ask some more intimate questions because I, I understood from the conversation there was space to ask about it. So it's a very complicated question because I know that we are faced with short time, but that's why I said I, I have more than 100 interviews. And quite often, some of them, if I read the first one to the last one, because some people I've been talking five, six, seven times, the, the kind of information that we are sharing, it's totally different. So it talks a lot about that part, uh, the levels of confidence and even my capacity to understand, to feel solidarity, uh, sometimes to listen to because people want to speak about problems that face their lives. And it's really complicated to, to face and to feel solidarity and sensibility, share sensibility with these people. Uh, finally, regarding what, uh, that's why I have that question about the ethics of sharing information. It's something very problematic to me. Uh, I, I always think 10 times before sharing. And each time, even when I have permission to share information, I have to think to myself that the person who is sending me information is using me as a messenger to the outside. To, so I'm not, I, I become not the informant, but the messenger, uh, because they want to share something and they want their information to reach in a certain time span, in a cer certain context. And uh, 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 Milton mentioned Luis Lafort. I, we are friends since a long time ago when we were in Prop uh, in Maputo. And this, those are questions. Sometimes we talk about certain questions and certain topics in certain contexts. And later on, uh, we can talk more in detail because we know about certain con conditionalities. So that brings me to my final argument. We really need to know a lot to ask small questions that are the big questions that we want, want to be tackled. And I'll tell another story. Uh, when I interview a, a woman in Northern Mozambique, in Yasa, a long time ago, when I was to, still doing my PhD, I didn't understand what she wanted to tell me. It, it was really strange. Later on, we met again, and the story was a really an interesting story. She was, she had been a, the girlfriend of uh, a GE, uh, meaning uh, paramilitary forces that had been being prepared in Mozambique if the country would become like a Southern Rhodesia, um, white minority regime. And this, uh, this girlfriend, a black girl, an African girl, um, when, in the, when the, the coup d'etat happened, uh, her, girl, her boyfriend we, was in the Portuguese army, understood perfectly the change in the correlations of forces. And all of he and his men all left to Rhodesia and became members of the Rhodesian army. So these are things that I later on learned, but then I didn't know about it. So it took me a while to understand the complexity of the struggle. But it all also started with a small photograph cutting off that she showed me. And she, she was telling me about this big love of her life who had been this guy. 
but she never mentioned his name. And uh, later on, years later that we met again, I was asking her about that person and why she only had that half of the picture that was her. And I knew it was a GA because of the color of the handkerchief around the neck, but I don't know his face. And she would tell me about how important this guy was in her life because he trusted her, because he pushed her to study, because that's why she was the person she was by then. But then finally, after all these years, I managed to ask her, say like, now that I work in Portugal, do you want me to try to find this person so that you can meet again? And she very briskly told me, no, I don't want. He told me that he was going, I was going to be the love of his life. If I find out that he betrayed me, I, I don't want to know. So that was the end of the conversation. I, I was trying to push that maybe you can get and get to, to another stage. And she very said, I know I have my family, but that was the love of my life. And I want to cherish that story. Although I had to destroy everything because uh, of those being, a, there was a, a high risk of myself being accused of having been a collaborator and having to have my photograph exposed. As we all know, that happened with uh, uh, all the collaborators between 78 and 78, 79 and 82. And she managed to survive, but she destroyed everything. So she has this half picture that is the half picture that reminds her of the love of her life. So those are stories that are really interesting. Uh, very sensitive, but we don't talk about them. Okay, I think there's a, a direct question for um, Amerton, which uh, I don't know if you can see here. It's from uh, Paolo, who's asking, I think it's really, a, sort of takes us back to the question of ethics, uh, whether it's ever possible to be entirely objective or neutral in what you see and how does that, you know, how do you deal with that in your own work? Um, and uh, Paula, I was actually thinking of the question from uh, Justin about collaborators, which of course you've answered. And I, I, I think, you know, most of us can see that, but definitely you can speak to that for the audience. But just in terms of what you were saying now, I just wondered if, if, if you could unpack for us a little bit more the you know the very idea of the collaborator here and, and obviously it seems to me this very fertile um, locus for controlling women's sexuality for the purpose of a nation building project right so so was that basically what it served and why you know uh, the figure of the collaborator who was obviously um, engaged in all sorts of transgressive and illicit relationships and romances and intimacies right so so was that what caught you know what 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 made it what it was or was there i don't know I, anyway i'm just thinking about that that term and yeah um and and uh Kayo, i i i uh, just to you i mean the the idea about self-archiving and which i think someone reflected or made a comment about it in the in the chat as well and if I don't know if you'd like to say something about the juxtaposition of the different images and, and to maybe say something very finally, we don't have a lot of time, but around how, you know, image and photography or even text uh, contributes in this, what you've called a project of self archiving. So, uh, Amelton, would you like to say something about yes. this question? Yeah. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Paul, for, the, for, the, for this question. So I think uh, as an anthropologist and a documentary photographer, sometimes you have to take out your, your bias, you know, because you have to deal with different projects. You have to deal with your beliefs. Uh, I did a project uh, 10 years ago about voodoo. Uh, and uh, this project, I, even though I don't agree, or if I agree, with the, with the even, 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 even despite from despite the, for my religion beliefs, if I have to know something, I have to I have to learn how to listen and to be neutral. Because if I, if I took I take my background to my to my work, 
the way I, I will photograph people, you will feel it that I have some bias, I have some judgments. I will, I will, I, I will, I will photograph people based on how I think. So uh, before I start the project, I have to, I used to say, take my skin out. So I have to be neutral in order to to learn and to understand and to try because my only my uh, my own responsibility is to is to is to talk about uh, is is to talk about people based on the why they say the why they say to me. I'm not creating uh, stories or I'm I'm not bringing my my bias inside the project. Just I'm delivering their message using photographer. That's all. It's the, it's it's their voice on the photography. So I don't I don't I don't create nothing. Just I'm, I'm listening to what they say to me. And uh, I try to put visually. So that's that's uh, and I've been. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, this method has been helping me a lot because I can separate, I can separate where I come from or where I am, uh, and to tell the story that uh, even though I don't agree, but uh, that's not a pro that's not the issue. I have to tell the story. Thank you. Okay, uh, the collaborators in Portuguese call os comprometidos. It's a big problem, the question of treason in a war, and that's why I started saying, let's think about Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Angola, and Namibia, because there was a war. And the war creates enemies who cannot live together in the same space. And that's why it explains why uh, the movements that came out of war, like Frelimo and Renamo, have a difficult time thinking about peace because it's it's a different time frame in terms of political achievement. So, uh, uh, and, and I understand you. We have to understand the complexity of the interactions between, especially Frelimo and the Portuguese army, to understand the complexity of the social landscape in Mozambique. So let's start from the beginning. On the 24th of April, 1974, the day before the coup d'etat in Portugal, uh, in Mozambique, 52% of the Portuguese army was of local incorporation, meaning Africans. So half of the army, of the Portuguese army, was made up of Africans. So the, the guys that did the coup d'etat were not very sure about what would be the results or the, the positions or the opinions of those guys as the power had shifted dramatically into another direction. It's not something very new. In Guinea-Bissau, the problem was rather similar. This colleague, there's a colleague of mine who just came out with a film about the commandos, the black commandos in Guinea-Bissau, which is a very interesting topic to address the question, identity processes, who belongs to where, and especially to understand that this idea of Portugal versus Mozambique was much more complex and hybrid groups were being built that suddenly became shattered when the coup d'etat happened in Portugal and it had implications in the Portuguese empire. So uh, basically uh, very quickly, so the coup d'etat is in April, we have all these men involved, but this, I would say that the vast majority of men and a lot of women were involved in the military forces. So there will be the military, there will be the supporters like Madrinhas de Guerra, War Godmothers, there will be the sisters and so on also involved. There will be then the irregular forces that were all over the countries. So I'm not going to go into detail, but there were lots of guns and lots of people with military training of all origins in the country. And also a lot of people that would support the Portuguese structure. So the Portuguese did not come and conquer. They were very good in dividing and creating structures of power that will allow them through cooptation and to collaboration to rule the region. Uh, being the case of traditional authorities, other authorities in urban spaces, 
And when Frelimu arrived, uh, it was a time uh, very complicated for this whole big group of authorities because they were all addressed as being collaborators, comprometidos. Why this question? Because the Portuguese, there are lots of possible explanations. One of them, I tried to address it, trying to understand Joana Smiel, who was a um, uh, uh, political woman, very prominent uh, in 74 in Mozambique. Later on, she got arrested in October 74, and she was sent to a re re-education camp in, where she was killed. Uh, but it shows perfectly that we had lots of what I would call petit bourgeoisie trying to get to power and be involved in the negotiations and fairly would negate the possibility of having them aboard, as was also the case in Angola and Guinea-Bissau, the only place where possible elections took place was Cape Verde. So it was a war context, lots of tensions. And for Frelimo, who was not with us, is against us. Quem não está conosco está contra nós. And that was the rule to create the notion of citizenship. So uh, from the beginning, a uh, lot of people could vote, but could not be elected. So traditional authorities, for example, could not be elected. And this group of collaborators was huge. Uh, as Hamilton mentioned, many of them were highly literated. So they had uh, high positions in state administration. Uh, I remember seeing their faces in the photographs exposed outside ministries, uh, uh, agencies, state agencies, private uh, institutions showing the collaborators. Uh, and there were a lot of meetings with them to, for them to publicly expose uh, their collaboration with the Portuguese or the, with colonial system. And later on, they, in 1982, I, 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 was part, I was present at the last meeting, which took place at Josina Michel, where I studied. Uh, and finally they said, so you now, you have come born again. Uh, so you now are citizens, you are no longer collaborators. What is interesting, it was a huge movement with photographs exposing people as collaborators. And they'll be in the windows, as I said, of public and private uh, sector. And I remember seeing their faces when we would walk downtown Maputo. Uh, and I can't, I, I think I have one picture of one of those events, but those pictures from those times disappear. And it's very difficult to call the attention to the violence of those imaginary, or calling people attention. Those are the collaborators, be aware that they can betray the country. So that was the feeling. The things went on, people say that they, they live through. Uh, I'm very cautious about using their names because normally they ask me not to reveal. There are very few times people, maybe because some of the people, um, they are not very comfortable about what I know about some of these stories. Uh, some of them, for instance, are people that were part of the Iriamu massacre. So that's just to show the level of complexity. There are normal people, people like Madrinhas, war godmothers that were caught up because they were associated with military, but then there were military really that carry out those actions. And most of them, they, once they recognize their role, uh, they will set free and the thing went on. I think from around, 120,000 people involved in this process of accused of being collaborators, around 300 uh, were sent to jail. So it was a very, a, a much smaller group. But that's just to explain what the collaborators was about. It's the specificity of Mozambique. It didn't happen in uh, Guinea-Bissau or in Angola. I'm trying to finish the book next year. The book will be out because I have lots of interviews and I got to listen to some of these processes. So it was really interesting. The three commissions that took that occurred with so-called traitors. Um, but uh, lots of people were really involved. And now 
it was a sort of amnesia that we created about that process. So most, quite often people don't know about it. So I don't know if I explain what the thing was about. No, well, we just have to really wait to read the book and then get you back and ask you some more questions, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, we're rapidly running out of time. So Kyle, just some final thoughts, maybe whatever direction you'd like to conclude. Yes, oh my God, I mean, this this uh, panel has been so rich and I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to 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 have it. Right now, there are a bunch of comments coming in. Unfortunately, we won't be able to address them because we are running out of time. So what I think we're going to do is that we are going to kind of get the transcript of the chat and we are going to share with our panelists. So if they are interested, they can get back to people uh, <clears throat> on their own. I, I'm really sorry for that. But I think, again, I, I think another, another question that is really um, present in both presentations is the issue of visual histories and the ways in which I, I don't think, I think historians, even when we use photographs, a lot of times they are done, it's done in a very kind of, um, illustrative way in which we don't really think about what does it mean to think visually and to think with visual sources. And I think the panel here really addressed this question in such a wonderful way. So it's not only a matter of what the images represent, but also the entire investment that is put on these images for their production and then their circulation through different archives. And I think what Paula just said now at the end, it's really, again, really powerful how, we, how these images, they are not, they also have a social and political life of their own. They are almost ki kind of quasi actors in these historical processes. So I, I, I really thank the, um, the panelists for highlighting that. And lastly, just a point of curiosity, but I was talking to a Milton about this the other day. And I think we in South Africa, most people don't know about it, but there were also South African women involved in this Godmothers of War movement through an organization that was running South Africa called the uh, Mozambique Soldiers Comfort Fund. And it was run out of Durban. And it was basically South African women who would fundraise, who would uh, uh, send gifts to the Portuguese soldiers in the front in Mozambique, send letters, like very affectionate letters and all that. So again, I mean, this is really uh, <laughs> an interesting, even if marginal part of the story, but a very interesting one. And I just wanted to leave this uh, as a little anecdote, again, trying to push us to think about these histories in a different manner. But thank you so much, the panelists, for this amazing, amazing uh, webinar. Yes, I mean, I've, I've really learned so much. And I think, yeah, it's also been really interesting having the, the chat. I don't know if you've been able to dip into it. And we'll try and, as Kari said, I'm sorry we haven't been able to you know, give you an opportunity to respond to all the comments and questions but I, I hope you've been seeing them come along. So yeah, it sounds like we really have to do some kind of um, follow up to this because there's just, yeah, there's just a lot to unpack. Just before we end, I actually have the book right here. Kyra, I don't know why I didn't show it at the start. So <laughs> in terms of self archiving and Mozambique, yeah. uh, this is the book I referred to at the start, which I don't know if there is a link, but uh, Utros Corpus Nosos is available from Gala, I think. To, for those who'd like uh, a copy and it's just I mean everything we've been really talking about it's images yeah. uh, which uh, and, and Kayo was you know the, 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 the story collector the story finder and the editor and that's the final product and we're just so so delighted it's here and the text is also in English and in Portuguese for everyone who's interested okay so uh, thank you so much to both uh, Paula and Hamilton, it's it's just yeah been an enormous pleasure. I think those those images will stay with all of us for a while. 
And just to tell uh, the audience, thank you so much for, for joining, uh, for making the time, for your, your, your comments, your questions, your curiosity and interest. And we'll be back not the coming week, but the week after for our final session. So please, please keep following and, and join us for that um, last, last hurrah. Um, so, and yeah, thank you. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you. Right. Thank, you, Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye. Bye.